the Initiative on Financial Security at the Aspen Institute. Uh, my joy today is to chair uh, the NASI Board of Directors, and I'm delighted to be here and to have the very pleasant task of introducing our speaker. Uh, from your agendas, you know our topic today, rather unusual uh, for NASI, is messaging social insurance, reframing the debate. And I particularly like the teaser title, which I will remind you of right under the, the text under the title. We've, we've given you the teaser. It says, social insurance experts and advocates, that's most of us, have a great story to tell. Why aren't more Americans listening and responding to it? So I think it's really interesting to ask why indeed. And it's a question that's troubled me for many years. As many of you know, I was a funder of policy at the Ford Foundation for 13 years. So I know that some of the answers to why messages don't go out go to money and who's behind them and who's helping to pay for the story. But today I think we are really uh, lucky to have uh, Dr. Drew Weston with us and to dig deeper into this question. As you know, every public opinion survey over the last 20 years has produced the same findings. Americans value Social Security and appreciate what it's done for them and their grandparents and parents, but they don't believe it will be there for them, and they think Medicare is unaffordable. Unaffor and in my view, that's a very dangerous dichotomy. So the big question, at least for me, is whether we're missing something. Are we missing some opportunities to break through all the distortions and the myths and the misrepresentation? Can we do a better job of conveying truth to the American public and building grassroots support for social insurance? And our speaker today is sincerely very well equipped to answer that question. Drew Weston made a big splash with a full-page op-ed in the New York Times last summer, positively headline, proact uh, provocatively headlined, What Happened to Obama? In that op-ed, Dr. Weston argued that President Obama, upon taking office during the worst economic meltdown since the Great Depression of the 1930s, had squandered an opportunity to tell Americans a compelling story about what had caused the crisis and how together we would confront it. Moreover, in Dr. Weston's view, the President had continued to squander opportunities to tell compelling stories that would enlist public support and assure us he was fighting for us. Instead, he gravitated toward undesirable compromises, hitched to phrases such as possible entitlement cuts, which Dr. Weston described as a poor choice of words that implies that people who work their whole lives are looking for handouts. It was a very controversial article for which Dr. Weston was both widely praised and roundly condemned. Sounds like a good place to be. But at NASI, what caught our attention was not whether Dr. Weston was right or wrong about President Obama's shortcomings or possible reasons for them. What made us want to invite you here today uh, was your forcefulness, Dr. Weston, and your clarity in making the case for powerful and sustainable messaging as an absolutely essential and prerequisite for any sort of progress, especially in the policy arena. And we are very pleased that you accepted our invitation. I've already warned him that messaging isn't the usual uh, nasty topic, uh, but I think we're in for a treat. Um, Dr. Wesson is a professor of psychology at Emory University in Atlanta and the author of The Political Brain, The Role of Emotion in Deciding the Fate of the Nation, a recent bestseller. He received his BA at Harvard his MA at the University of Sussex in England, his PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Michigan, and he currently teaches three courses at Emory, including the Psychology of American Electoral Politics. Uh, Dr. Weston also runs a consulting firm, Weston Strategies, which has a striking motto. Wherever you're heading, ideas provide the roadmap, but emotions provide the fuel. I like that. And I think we ignore your... Uh, your motto at our peril. So we've asked Dr. Weston to speak for about 20 minutes, and then in Nazi tradition, uh, to take a few questions. This is a group that likes taking questions. Um, so uh, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Drew Weston to Nazi's uh, 21st conference. Uh, 
Lisa, thank you very much for the very kind introduction, and uh, thank you for in, uh, for inviting me here to uh, to speak with you today. Um, in some ways, you just did a big piece of what I'm going to recommend, which is that you um, you told the story, and uh, one of the things that we don't do enough. Uh, with respect to social insurance, is to tell the story of uh, of uh, where it came from and why we had it. And uh, God knows, maybe we wouldn't have been in the sh in the in the place we're in now uh, if we had had some more effective storytelling uh, that was uh, explaining to the American people along the way in an evocative way uh, uh, how it is that we got to the situation where. Uh, where when people hit 65, they are only semi-destitute as opposed to completely destitute, uh, and that they have the they they finally have health insurance after the last 10 years of not having had health insurance. Uh, so, um, with that beginning, um, I'm gonna uh, as a psychologist and neuroscientist, I can't stop myself from beginning with an experiment. Um, uh, let me. Um, So I'm going to begin with the experiment. You are the um, you are the subjects, the unwitting subjects. If you get out your uh, imaginary consent forms, thank you very much for signing them. Um, what I'd like you to do is to memorize the following pairs of words. You ready? Okay. Ocean, moon, floor, table, eyeglass, chair. Okay. Do you have those? Okay, and I, I know that that some of you are are um, are uh, in your your fifties or sixties. Uh, so am I. So it's just as challenging a task for me to remember them. Now, what I'd like you to do is, um, when I raise my hand, and I really need you to do this, I want you just to shout out the name of the first vegetable that comes to your mind. Okay, are you, are you ready? But wait till the hand goes up. Okay, no consensus. Uh, this is truly an American audience. Um, you could all be you could all be members of Congress now. The, the, your badges will be waiting for you outside. Um, now, what I'd like to do, but wait till my hand goes up, is when I raise my hand, I'd like you to shout out the name of the first laundry detergent that comes to your mind. Are you ready? I'm sorry you've been fired from the Senate. Um, uh, how many of you said Tide? How many of you said something else? We have a we have a neurologist waiting right outside there. Uh, the um, the market share of Tide is uh, is roughly forty percent. Uh, in a room, um, and I'm going to come back to the way I just said that in a second. Um, the in a, in a room from anywhere from a, a boardroom with six eight people around it to a, a room with three thousand people in it, I can reliably get somewhere between eighty five and one hundred percent of people to say tie. Now here's the here's the question: How was it that I was able to do that? I wish we had time to do a little focus group because because uh, if I did that, you'd hear answers like if I if I just went around and said, "Why did you say tie?" People say, "Well." I know. I just kind of picture the orange, that orange box, or uh, I think my mom used that when I was a kid, or that's what we use at home. Well, that's what we use at home only works for forty percent of you. Um, I was going to say, by the way, uh, uh, or I could have said, the market share of Tide uh, is forty-one point three two percent. That is the kind of way of talking with the American people uh, that leads them to believe that um, Social Security and Medicare will not be there for them. Um, <laughs> The, anything past the decimal, except in um, in rocket science and, and nuclear physics, is usually really irrelevant and usually unreliable. Um, but we use that kind of speech all the time. Um, uh, those of you who who who, um, uh, who are in the business world probably know that you would never use that kind of language in an advertisement. Um, it is typically a problem. Of people towards the left, uh, who uh, who tend to like to you to quote facts and figures, and one of the one of my main points today is going to be that that um, that uh, you want to be using the same kind of science in learning how to speak to the public about social insurance 
as you use in your actuarial, actuarial tables because, in fact, you can have the best policies in the world uh, and uh, they will gradually get eroded or destroyed if you don't use the best available science to figure out how it is that you talk with people about them. And that's something that, that the opponents of this group know extremely well, uh, and they've been practicing it for a very, very long time. Um, uh, now, there's a, there's a, uh, if you want to know why you said Tide, for those of you who don't use it at home, you're not the 40%. Um, I actually uh, activated what, what uh, neuroscientists call uh, a network of associations. That is an interconnected set of thoughts and feelings and images, values, emotions, images, et cetera, as you'll see in a second, by beginning uh, with those word pairs, by saying ocean, moon. Because what ocean, moon does is to activate uh, a network that has ocean, moon, waves, tides. Now, ocean and moon, I said consciously, and by the way, the reason I gave you vegetable in the middle uh, was just as a, 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 to clean your, clear your cognitive palate. I was just trying to distract you. Because uh, I didn't want any doubters in the room to say, well, I was thinking about ocean and moon. No, you weren't. All right? You were long past ocean and moon. Uh, I also never said waves or tide, but those were now at a higher state of latent activation in your brains simply because I'd activated part of the network. And by activating part of the network, it actually increased the activation of the rest. Uh, we know actually now from research in cognitive science that that level of, that heightened level of activation actually lasts for at least a year. No one's done a study looking at how much longer it lasts, but it lasts for at least a year and can be detected uh, a year later. Um, when I then said laundry detergents, it activated all fab cheer, but you'll notice the point of intersection in the center is tied which was doubly activated, and that's why um, Tide was most likely to become conscious. None of this uh, is in your conscious awareness. Um, and and the, um, the striking thing is that, um, that it is, it's this kind of activation of networks, uh, as well as the activation of emotions, as well as doing, activating networks and activating the right networks and activating emotions in the context of stories that sells um, your product, and your product is social insurance. And many of you probably are probably thinking, I, I hate hearing someone talk like that. Those of you in the business business world are like, well, that's how people talk about it. And we got to bring we got to bring our product to market. Uh, um, but talking about selling social insurance, um, um, you know, it sounds like you're in good hands with Allstate. Um, and in fact, that's how you want people to feel about Social Security. That's how you want them to feel about Medicare, Medicaid, uh, unemployment insurance, workers' comp, the, the, all, all of the, 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 the things that develop out of the New Deal and later out of the Great Society. That's what you want people, uh, people to feel. Um, I'd love to show you something, but I think I'm going to skip over a clip. I've got a couple of clips to show you about what happens when people don't do this. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to give you some examples, and if I, um, uh, if I look, look like I'm looking over your heads uh, occasionally, uh, it is because uh, that's where the monitor is, and I'm using my aging eyes and realizing that I need to go see the ophthalmologist um, uh, to try to see what, what it is. But let me give you some examples. When you say global warming, what do you activate? Well, I can tell you exactly what I thought the first time I heard the term global warming. I was living in Boston at the time, and I thought, that sounds great. <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe I'll actually get to enjoy an April someday. That, that's, what, that, that's what I thought. If you think about it, what are the associations to warming? Warming, warmth, hearth, home, uh, fireplaces. I mean, it's all good stuff. Um, that's not where you want people to be. If you want them to be concerned about a phenomenon. Something that has emerged uh, recently that I think is actually really bad news for, um, for our planet and our country and really good news for the possibility of changing that uh, is that uh, people have begun to see extreme weather with their own eyes. And that term extreme weather carries none of the baggage in its overhead compartment uh, that global warming does. And I hope that term catches fire. Uh, uh, and I hope that, uh, that, that some of the people who, who are uh, who've been trying to work on this issue for years 
start incorporating that into some of their messaging or at least testing it because I have a feeling not only because it's more powerful language, but also because it's something that the average person can feel and see viscerally and it actually will move people. Some other examples. Universal health care. Uh, I led the efforts for, uh, for the, uh, the major nonprofits that were working on the messaging health care before the 2008 election. They were used by a number of the candidates. Uh, uh, it was led by, by uh, Families USA and the Herndon Alliance and AARP and uh, a number of other groups. And what we found is that if you said to someone, um, uh, if you began a statement with, I believe in universal health care, and then you outlined three principles, uh, and then uh, you measured how, uh, against a tough opposition message, how likely they were to support it, you get about 50%. Um, if instead you began by saying, I believe in a family doctor for every family, 70-30, that's, and that's by saying the exact same principles, but simply primed, as I primed you with Ocean Moon, uh, priming a different set of associations. When you think of a family doctor for every family, uh, not only are you feeling that warmth that you feel with global warming, uh, <laughs> But you are, you are also inoculating against everything that was used to try to kill off health care reform. Socialized medicine, a family doctor, for a, 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 a bureaucrat between you and your doctor. All that stuff is very, very difficult when someone says, uh, well, you're for, you're for a bureaucrat between you and your doctor. And you say, wait, wait, wait. I told you I'm for a, a family doctor for every family. Uh, how do you see a bureaucrat in that room? And the only way a bureaucrat gets in that room is if a health insurance company gets in that room. And then they're, they're in a position that they don't particularly, uh, particularly want to be. Uh, the, uh, another, actually, one other thing I'll mention about that, that about universal health care. Um, uh, and um, this is another principle of messaging I've learned from a number of years of research in this area, which is on issues that have a racial charge, it is better to get them out in the open rather than to let those issues, let, let the, 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 the racial prejudice fester. Um, and that is that when people see universal health care, when white swing voters hear universal health care, they think um, big clinics with long lines of people of color getting inferior care. That's what they picture. That's what's activated unconsciously. So if you allow that to happen, then they're going to be scared as all hell. And they're going to be scared, one, because 85% of them at least have insurance now and are, are comfortable with the insurance they have, even though they're, they're really worried about the price. And the other is the you're activating unconscious prejudices. Um, the, in contrast, uh, our better values on race and ethnicity uh, are our conscious values. Uh, that's where our better angels are. Uh, and so if you, I mean, the average white person doesn't wake up in the morning in America uh, these days and look in the mirror and go, hmm. I'm a bigot. I'm proud. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's where we were in my part of the country 40 years ago, but it's not where we are now. The average American uh, doesn't want to see himself or herself as bigoted. Um, but that doesn't mean that we aren't all prone to unconscious prejudices that can show up when, for example, the taxi driver doesn't speak the language very well and you start to get annoyed when they take you to the wrong Marriott. I mean, those are the kind of places where Yes, you have a real concern, but other stuff starts to percolate. Uh, and, uh, and getting it out in the open uh, tends to be the best way to deal with that. I'm going to show you a message on Medicaid in a moment uh, that addresses that. Um, entitlements. Um, this is something Lisa mentioned before. I'd recommend never using the word entitlements. The term entitlements, and this is, this is a word that, that uh, as far as I know, and um, there might be some people here who could tell me otherwise. Uh, this is not a term that, that, that uh, FDR ever used to describe, um, <laughs> to describe any program in the New Deal. Uh, entitlement suggests that you're asking for something that you don't deserve. Um, it, it, they, it is a, it's a word, by the way, that the, um, the concept of entitlement, uh, I say this now as a, as a, as a psychologist who segued from um, from uh, being a, 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 a researcher who studied personality disorders to moving into politics, you can see the easy segue. Um, <laughs> that, um, the term, the, the, uh, 
feeling entitled to things you don't deserve is actually one of the diagnostic criteria for narcissistic personality disorder. That tells you the kind of associations that entitlements have. Instead, you're so much better talking about insurance that we pay for through our taxes. Because what you do when you say that is, um, and that's why I was so happy when I, when I, when I saw the name of your organization, uh, is that, um, that what you're doing is you're saying, this is a form of insurance. This is just, it's insurance that we pay for through our taxes. I, and we know that on the other end of that, that insurer happens to be the most powerful organization in the entire world. Uh, and um, they're not going to go bad for their debts. And we're not making good use of that. We're not making good use of that story of who is on the other end of those premiums that we pay. And again, I'm going to show you a Medicaid message in a moment that gets at that issue, if I can, uh, if I can do my best not to, uh, to evade looking at our timekeeper. Um, so um, uh, I'll, I'll end with Medicare recipients. As soon as you say recipients, you're making people sound like they are passive receptacles for government waste and fraud. I mean, that's, that's what you're doing. You're saying, these are people who just want, gimme, 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 gimme. Um, if instead you say, people who rely on Medicare for their health or for their health care, everybody gets it. But now, if, and, and this is something that I can't emphasize enough. Whenever you're tempted to say things like the unemployed, never say the unemployed, because what you're doing is you're taking peop real people with pain-lined faces and, and histories that if you listen to them um, uh, would, would, would put a lump in your throat, and you're turning them into a nameless, faceless abstraction, and you want to do exactly the opposite. Uh, and any time you can turn something around so that it is people who, then it becomes about real people. So. People who've lost a job through no fault of their own. That's very different from the unemployed. Um, so let me move ahead. Uh, three principles of effective messaging, and this is going to be one of my subliminal slides that I'm going to go through quickly. Um, one of them is tell a coherent, memorable story. We are a storytelling species. We evolved that way. It is not an act that we, that we uh, uh, emerge as a species about 150,000 years ago, if I were going to do the usual thing on the left, I'd say, of course, scientists debate based on the carbon dating evidence, the, car uh, uh, the, the, uh, the carbon dating evidence, whether it was really somewhere between 125 and 175 years, 75,000. Some even think that if you look at the remains in Africa, don't need all that. We've been around for about 150,000 years. It was not until a few thousand years ago that we saw the first evidence of any kind of literacy in cave dwellings, uh, in cave walls. And it was not until the end of the 20th century, that for the first time, more humans were literate than not. Well, what does that mean? It means that how was it that, that our species managed to pass on knowledge and values over, over, over millennia? We did it through stories. And it's not an accident that the great monotheistic religions that emerged over the last 5,000 years, all of them, their holy books are written in parables. Why are they written in parables? They're written in parables because people remember stories. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment. And actually, Lisa illustrated it when she sort of told you the story about why um, I, was, um, I was asked to be here, and which you may come to regret. Um, <laughs> the, um, there are, there are, one of the things that I've learned from, uh, from doing, um, doing messaging research with now about 60 or 70,000 Americans over the last five or six years um, uh, some through focus groups, some through online dial testing, where you have people uh, listen to, it, to a series of messages while they're moving a slider this way if they like what they're hearing and moving it this way if they don't. And what you get is, is what looks like what I see. It, it looks like what you see, saw during the State of the Union address, uh, where you could see the dials moving up and down at, 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 uh, at different points. Um, one of the things that I've learned is that there's a structure to an effective political narrative uh, uh, that uh, I would recommend that you think about and use, and that is that you always start with something that connects with people in the center who may not start out with you. Um, it's usually a value-laden, aspirational statement. Sometimes it's, a, it's directly something that addresses their ambivalence about what you're talking about. I mean, people are ambivalent about social insurance, and in part that's because we haven't done a good enough job selling it, and in part it's because there's some foes of it, foes of it who've told some really good stories about it, like that Social Security is insolvent. Um, 
the, the, um, and they've done a better job of t telling those stories. Um, sorry, it's, that's not connecting with my audience. Uh, but I've already been talking with you, so now I can tell you, the, tell you the bad stuff. That gets to the middle part. That's when you raise the concerns. Uh, once you've connected, once, this, once, once people, your listeners are saying, oh, you know, this is someone who, who's making some sense. This is someone who shares my values. Now you tell them what your concerns are, and you do it in as evocative, visceral ways as you possibly can. And then you end with something hopeful. The last thing you want to do is to make people anxious or angry and then go, goodbye, nice to see you. Uh, all that does is actually it leads to denial or for them not to like you, and neither one is a very good outcome as a messenger. The second principle is if you don't feel it, don't use it. Uh, this was something that, that, uh, that FDR was a master of. This was something that, that uh, Bill Clinton was a master of. He knew it every uh, – Bill Clinton knows it every second what you are feeling when he's giving a speech. Uh, and he did as president. And that's part of why he was so remarkably effective in, in, in getting across a, uh, an agenda with, a, with, a, with an opposition Congress. Um, uh, and uh, – why he got past some hurdles that no normally no mortal could get past, um, <laughs> as well as a remarkable capacity for compartmentalization that, boy, do I wish I could <laughs> develop. Um, but the, the point is that um, if something is, is emotionally inert, it is politically inert. And again, I give you some of, the, some of the background of the neuroscience and the evolutionary science behind this, but the point is that if you don't feel something, then your audience isn't going to feel it. Uh, and if they don't feel it, it's not going to move them. I mean, movement is about moving people. And I'm seeing, that, and I'm seeing a sign that says, move. So, um, you know, I think I'm just going to have to skip over these clips, although, no, this one I've, I've got to show you. All right. Uh, if, um, uh, if you could go ahead and hit, hit on this one. This is... This is one of the greatest moments in democratic communication. Under the governor's plan, if you kept the same fee for service that you have now under Medicare, your premiums would go up by between 18 and 47 percent, and that's the study of the congressional plan that he's uh, modeled his proposal on by the Medicare actuaries. You can, you There's a man here tonight named George McKinney from Milwaukee. You can, okay, um, that's as good an example as you get of bad political communication. <laughs> Uh, that was in, in Gore's first debate with, uh, with the future uh, President George W. Bush. Um, and it's a great example in which he used figures that he didn't need to use that no one was going to remember. He reinforced a story that he was kind of a technocrat who really didn't care much about people but cared a lot about numbers. Uh, and then it allowed George Bush to go, fuzzy bath, fuzzy bath, and then that was the end of any... You know, <laughs> Any, any kind of, any kind of uh, numbers that he could use at all for the rest of the campaign, um, other, than, other than numbers going like this, um, um, and numbers that got a little messed with at the end. But um, the, the, uh, the point of it is, let me, let me say what he just said again, but in a slightly, oh, and by the way, an appeal to Medicare actuaries, um, that's not really high, yeah, I know. I'm sure for this group that would be a great appeal. Um, but the average American doesn't know what an actuary is, uh, which played into the story about Gores having to be the smartest guy in the room. And if they did know, they probably wouldn't like one. Anyways, nothing personal. But that, that's, that, that's, that's where they are. So that's probably not the greatest group to appeal to. Imagine if he instead said, had said this. Look, under the government's plan, or the governor's plan, your fees are going to go up by about one-third. Now, if you're on a tight income or if you're on a fixed income, that's a lot of money. And that's not how we treat middle class and working people in this country, and that's not how we treat our parents and our grandparents in this country. I said the exact same thing he did, but notice the difference in what you felt. Um, the, um, I want to show you one good example of um, – uh, and I, I, I often present this to Democrats because they're the worst defenders on this – uh, uh, Republicans, in part because they tend to come from business uh, or from the, from the pulpit, uh, tend to be much better on messaging. Uh, they know to tell a story and they know to market it. I mean, they know that, I mean, they know that you're, taking, you're taking 
policy ideas to market. That's what you're doing. Um, and, again, that's not how we like to think, many of us who are on the Democratic side of things, but that's the reality. And if you, if you have ever listened to one of Franklin Roosevelt's speeches, um, uh, he could tell the most complex, talk about the most complex ideas that were so far from people's imagination of what government could or should do, and he sold people on them in a way that they said, I like it, I like him, I trust it, I trust him, let's do it. Uh, and that's what we have to be doing uh, 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 as, as, as his heirs. Um, so I want to show you, this is, a, this is one of the best times, best responses I've ever seen by a, a, a Democrat. I'm just going to show you the first 10 seconds of, of Jim Webb's response to this. When I graduated from college, the average corporate CEO made 20 times what the average worker did. Today, it's nearly 400 times. In other words, it takes the average worker more than a year to make the money that his or her boss makes in one day. Okay, if you could stop. All right. Now, isn't that powerful? And that's filled with numbers, right? So um, why is that powerful? Because he's activating values and he's activating emotions. He's activating the value of fairness. And that's all about what the president tried to do in the State of the Union address this week. It was all about about, uh, about trying to activate the value of fairness. Now, the question you might ask is, given the history of Democrats uh, after Roosevelt uh, being uh, typically so awful at messaging, why was it that Jim Webb, who had been a senator for two weeks at this time, uh, was able to give, uh, I think that for the first time, I think it's the only time I've ever seen the response to the State of the Union address eclipse the State of the Union address in 2006. Um, it's because he used to be a Republican. Anyway, if, if we, the, my point is not that we should dumb down our messages. It is that we should increase their emotional intelligence. I'm going to uh, end with, end with a, a point on this slide, and then I'm just going to show you a couple examples, and then I promise the timekeeper that I'll stop and leave uh, time for us to talk. Um, know what networks uh, you're activating. Uh, and I've already I've already shown you some examples of that, so I won't get into that. But I will get into it in the in the examples in a couple of examples of, of some effective messaging on Medicaid. So, um, a methodology for developing effective messages. Uh, I, I, the only thing I'm going to say about this is because I, I don't have a lot of time to get through the details. But but what what I've learned over time is that one of the most effect that, that one of the most effective ways to think about about messaging is the same way you think about policy, and that is how do we use our best scientific methods to figure out how to talk to the American people about something that somebody else is talking to them about from an opposite pr perspective and that they may not naturally grasp. How do you do it? And one way is to study the existing polls, to figure out what's worked, what's not worked, study the policy, and this is something that I'll, I do routinely on, on issues, um, then to do this kind of online dial testing that I described uh, a moment ago with large representative national samples so that um, you're watching a thousand people or several hundred people if you split your sample responding to a message so now you can say, oh, I see, that phrase didn't work and you can try to figure out why it is that it, that it didn't. Just to give you one very quick example, I was doing some work on, um, and this is a pretty striking one, uh, that uh, I was doing some work on um, on, uh, on this was before gay marriage had passed any of the states. Uh, and I was doing some work on gay marriage and civil unions. And I, I, a couple of messages I was testing were messages that, that, that used fairly standard language about people being able to visit the person that they love by their bedside. Uh, and I noticed something odd when I looked at the dial test. And that was that the dials went up like this and then, uh, and then there was a drop at the end. And I thought, well, that's really odd. This is a kind of uncontroversial statement that people ought to be able to visit people they, they love the most at their bedside in the hospital. And then I thought, wait a minute. And I clicked a little button and stratified by gender. And I looked at the men versus the women. And the women went straight up. And the men went straight up. And as soon as I said bedside, they went down like this. What I had inadvertently done was to activate in males, um, I had put gay and bed in the same sentence. And it activated in males what gay activists and advocates call the ick factor. 
Um, and simply by, you'd think the context would, would get rid of that, but it didn't. So uh, in the next round, I tested it with, uh, by their, uh, uh, by in, their, in their room, by their side at the hospital. Women, men, dials looked identical. Uh, that's how much something that small can make a difference uh, in your messaging. Uh, so let me uh, conclude with a couple of um, a, a couple of examples. <laughs> these are these are lessons from Medicaid. This is research that that, uh, that I did for uh, First Focus uh, uh, on the the other side of of, of the age spectrum. Uh, many of you probably know First Focus is an organization that works for uh, ad advocacy for children. Um, the numbers that you see in parentheses, uh, these are brief um, talking points, for want of a better word. They're the kind of things that you can use when you're on television with Chris Matthews and you get that six seconds in before uh, Chris cuts you off. Um, um, but they're also things that you can pepper in speeches. They are going to be the applause lines. I can, I've heard that from many members of Congress. Um, uh, that, but the numbers in parentheses are the, are the percentage of voters in a large national sample who preferred this message to, an to the strongest opposition message that the other side was actually using. And you're seeing some extraordinarily large numbers in the 60s and 70s, which is very unusual. Uh, but if politicians want to cut somebody's health care, let them start with their own. There's one that appeals to people. <laughs> if our leaders want to make sure Medicare and Medicaid are financially sound, there's one way to do it. Put Americans back to work so more people are paying their premiums again and let millionaires and big corporations pay their fair share of taxes, taking off on a populist theme. Whether you're white, black, or brown, there's nothing more painful than having a sick child and not being able to take them to the doctor because you can't afford it. It's time we help those parents to get back to work, not take away health insurance for their kids. Now notice about that, that this, is, this was the third top message out of about 40 that we tested, and it's a message that's explicitly race conscious from the start, which again speaks to that point of get it out on the table. And people are saying, of course, whether you're white, black, or brown, you, ought to have, you shouldn't have to, have to not take your kids to the, to the doctor. I'll just show, give you one, you know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll skip over this one and just show you one longer message and then conclude. This is more of a narrative, and this is a narrative for this project was for Medicaid in particular. And I want to, I'll emphasize a couple things about it after I read it to you. If, uh, a couple things about it, you'll notice that 76% of the people, if you look top right uh, of your, uh, of, on the screen, 76% said, gave this a 60 or above on a 0 to 100 scale, which means this is a home run message. 54%. Uh, um, uh, over 50% gave it an 80 to 100, which means high emotional intensity. Beat the opposition by 45 points with swing voters as well as with the general population. And again, this is a message that, that is directly race conscious, but it's also saying something about taxes that you're not going to expect to hear. So here, here's how it goes. Medicaid is the last resort for most Americans when they need health care, whether they're poor, middle class, old, young, white, black, or brown. It's the place millions of Americans with disabilities and children from low-income families turn for their care. By the way, that's something that most people don't know. Um, it's the place millions of our seniors turn when they need long-term care that Medicare doesn't cover, and it takes care of about two-thirds of all people in nursing homes in America, another thing they don't know. And it's the place where working and middle-class Americans turn when they've lost their job or run through all their savings to pay for an illness. That's what happened to Jennifer, whose daughter was diagnosed with a malignant brain tumor when she was 15 months old. Jennifer had to quit her job to take care of her baby through months of chemo and hospitalizations. Her family could no longer afford health insurance, but we as Americans pitched in through Medicaid, and today she has a beautiful, healthy four-year-old girl. Jennifer's story makes me proud to be an American. Her daughter is alive because we were there. Now, the, the thing I'll just mention about that is notice that at the end, it's connecting patriotism with paying your taxes. How many messages do that? And it's making people feel like, yeah, we pitched in. It's using the, the, the analogy of a neighbor 
instead of the analogy of someone who's having tax money stolen from their wallets, which is what the other side is always saying about taxes. So finally, uh, this is, by the way, what the dials look like. What you see is um, swing voters and strong Democrats, the 20 percent farthest to the left in America, uh, which is to the right of, of where things were during the New Deal. That's another whole story. Um, uh, they all they love the message. 69. The the, the average uh, the average rating at the end of this on a zero hundred scale among the farthest right, tw the 20 percent of of self-identified strong Republicans gave this a 69 at the end. Um, they should be in the 30s on a message like this, and instead they're in, they're they're in the high 60s. So what are, what can we conclude? One. In 1935, Franklin Roosevelt described economic security as the goal behind social security and other forms of social insurance. He chose his words very well. And let me give you the two reasons why I think that's the case, other than that I just happen to have a tremendous idealization of him. Uh, one is in, he, was act, he was activating some very powerful networks. An insurance analogy is one that everyone understands. And it is much better than a socialism analogy, or uh, which was one of the analogies his critics were using, as well as all the other analogies uh, that typically are used. So insurance is something everybody gets, and every responsible person who can afford it gets. And to say that we're going to have insurance that's paid for through our taxes, that's something people can say, all right, I feel good about that. Second, economic security parallels with national security. And in some ways, this was foreshadowing nine years later his Four Freedom speech and the idea of freedom from want as a basic freedom that all humans, um, and he would like, to, would, would have liked to start with all Americans, would have, and that um, I think many of us wish we could all see today. Um, finally, we should be as thoughtful and data-driven driven on our messaging on social insurance as we are in our actuarial predictions. You can have the best data you want the, on the best policies you want if they don't get implemented, if the public doesn't believe in them, if someone else is telling a better story about why it's not true, they'll go nowhere. And with that, I will thank you for, uh, for listening. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg. We're not going to let you go too far because we're going to have a few questions. Uh, you, nasty folks know our policies. We got a couple of mics and a roving mic. Lisa's got that back there. Can I start though? I I want to go back to that very fun tide example. And I, uh, I don't, I've never used tide. Here I was shouting it out. Uh, so uh, here's my question for you. I really work for Procter and Gamble. I just have to disclose that. Wow. Um, my paradox that I was posing about people who think Medicare has been great for grandma but won't be there for me. When we're feeling like there are misstatements or truth, uh, you know, things that aren't true, and we feel like we're fighting against uh, tide, we feel like we're fighting against something that's already locked in, in minds, what's, what is some of, what is the, what is the prescription that you would say? And great, then I'm going to sit down and hope others are coming to it. It's a great, it's a great question. Um, and I'll answer it two ways, and, and I'll try to do it briefly, even though I'm an academic. And, and uh, it's not in, as um, President George W. Bush would have said, my NDA. Um, or my, 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 my AMD. I'm, I mean, my DNA. Uh, um, the first answer is um, we should do our best not to get ourselves in a position where we're fighting against the tide. And that's been our mistake over and over and over again. Um, the second is that the best, uh, the best response to a narrative is a counter-narrative. Uh, and the best response to a sticky statement, those of you who, who are in business and understand marketing, that concept of stickiness, the idea of something that when you say it, uh, whether it's a tagline, a slogan, whether it's an image, that is iconic, it sticks in people's minds. We need sticky statements. Um, uh, those kind of, uh, um, I now sound like, um, um, like, a, like, a, like a Monty Python um, uh, uh, routine, but we need 
sticky statements. But we, 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 need, um, we need statements that stick, and that's what the other side always uses. Uh, and it's what it's what um, one of the things that when, when I do when I do messaging work in this kind of area, I always test those broader narratives because those are one of the things that we're always missing. But I also always test those kind of brief talking points now. And I learned that simply by, frankly, mostly talking with members of Congress, who if you um, if you show them those first, they are hooked because they realize that's something I can insert in a speech. And someone will get it, and it will stick. And if you use it over and over, it will really stick. And then the broader narrative is what you want people to have to gradually build. And if you think of the person who did this most effectively, it was really Ronald Reagan. Uh, uh, Reagan was, or, or certainly, uh, um, I think probably he and FDR were the two were the, were the two best communicators this way. And that was that Reagan didn't start with government is the problem, not the solution. He got there. So that that became a, 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 a very brief, sticky encapsulment of a much broader narrative that he was telling about the New Deal paradigm. And, but, uh, but once that stuck in people's minds, that has stuck for the last 30 years, uh, and that's the paradigm that everyone is still working with today. Thanks so much. I'm going to start with Nancy and then come over to this mic. Nancy Amaday, Civic Engagement Project in Seattle. Thank you for that. I have two examples I want to try out on you. You warned us, you warned us against the use of the word entitlement. What if we were speaking of tax entitlements? Um, referring to for tax entitlements for whom? Rich people. Uh, yes, that's that's a great use of entitlement because now you're now you're turning it on the other side. Okay. Um, so uh, that that works, and it's the same thing, by the way, for if you you, for example, uh, don't want to see um, tax hikes on the middle class, mm -hmm. um, then you call them tax hikes, or if you want to see if you want to see um, uh, see tax increases on the very wealthy, um, you don't call them tax cuts because tax cuts sounds like a good thing. You call them tax breaks, tax loopholes. You use all those kind of tax entitlements. Evasions, all those kind of words that convey what, you're what it is that you're trying to convey. So that's a great example. The second example comes from something in our area in Seattle where people who care about housing and homelessness tried out a message with people which was, everyone deserves a safe, affordable place to live. That went down. What worked was everyone deserves the opportunity for a safe, affordable place to live. The first apparently conjured up this notion of, yeah, but what did they do to deserve it? Everybody just, you know, they're just taken. And the second sounded like we're giving you a chance to work for it. Do you think that would work in other areas like social insurance? Well, this is, it's, it's, a, it's a great example because, um, in fact, Americans don't tend to believe in, in and for those of you who, are, who lean left, you won't like to hear this, but... Uh, it's a, I'll, 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 I'll tell you the inconvenient truth. Uh, Americans do not like the language of rights until after they've been conferred by law. Once they're established, they see things as rights. Before they've been established, um, there isn't a consensus, and especially if they apply to people who they see as not like them, mm -hmm. good luck. Uh, and that's why you pair... They have the right to, or they have the you know the entitlement to, or they have the um, uh, deserve. What was it? Where, where deserve. Do you, they deserve. They deserve. It's suggesting that they have a right, a right to a home, and people go, no, actually, you know, go get a job if you want a home, and you ought to work for it and build up your credit record. And it's exactly, it's exactly right. We found something really similar in a project I did for Robert Wood Johnson Foundation on health disparities, uh, not health care disparities, but health disparities uh, uh, between, for example, people of color, particularly uh, African-American and white people. Uh, and if we said to a focus group of white swing voters, um, you know, um, there are, there are, there's a, a, on average about six or seven year difference in life expectancy of the average black person born in America and the average white person. They'd say, no, there's not. We'd say, well, actually, those are the Census data. They go, no, they're not. 
And it didn't matter what we said. They, 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 simply, they simply rejected, rejected the information, uh, and, and they were ready to move on. Or they would start coming up with the reasons for it. They'd say, well, you know, if they'd stopped going to McDonald's all the time, then maybe they wouldn't get so fat, and maybe they wouldn't, you know, and it went off into all this kind of stuff. Um, what we learned was if instead of using that kind of language, uh, uh, in that case, um, uh, appealing to the facts-based community was not helpful. Uh, what was helpful was was um, was to begin with a with a um, with a statement that everyone ought to have the opportunity to make the choices that allow them to be healthy. And and it ended and it began by saying uh, everyone ought to show some personal responsibility in their lives to try to eat well. But you know, and, and this is a case of where we use what, what, we, what we call, and I, eventually, I, I learned later uh, from uh, Tony Blair's political team, they use exactly the same term. Uh, they call them killer facts, which are that one or two facts, those one or two facts that you want to use in a, in a statement that make people's heads swivel. In this case, we said, you know, um, people ought to exercise personal responsibility in what they eat and what they feed their families. But in the entire city of Detroit, in a 150-square-mile radius, do you know there are only five grocery stores, but there are hundreds of convenience stores? And we come back around and say, you know, people ought to, have the, uh, uh, ought to exercise personal responsibility in the decisions they make that affect their health and the health of their families. But every American ought to have an equal opportunity to exercise that responsibility. And do you know what? We got with the with the um, with the self-identified strong Republicans uh, in the in the focus groups. They were yeah, and in the in the in the online dial test, they went straight up like this, just like the strong Democrats, just like the strong moderates, the people right in the center. Drew, you have provoked quite a line out here of questions, so I'm going to go over here. Hi. Um, I, I liked what you were saying earlier in the presentation about messaging entitlements versus insurance we pay through our taxes. Um, in talking to people about Social Security who don't have a lot of deep background, I found that the term earned benefits seems to work very well. And the reason it seems to work well is because it's, it's pretty understandable and it creates a dividing line between things you've earned and things that are quote unquote welfare. But because it, it provokes people to say, um, I paid for it. And that's like ends the conversation. I paid for it, that's, that's all there is to it, I get it. You know, you better explain to me why I don't get it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if, if things like that, if this, this idea of this is something I, not only, I don't just have a right, I've already paid for it, is something that we can use more. You know, I think it's a, it's a great point, it is great language, uh, because it does in fact say, this is something that I earned. It also, I should, and I'll throw this out as, as a danger. I, I, haven't, I haven't done research on Social Security. I've done research on Medicaid and peripherally Medicare. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'll, I'll throw it out as a possibility. One of the, I think as policy people, you want to think carefully about any ways that you change Social Security that involve um, cutting back uh, in various ways on Social Security payments to people who are relatively wealthy uh, or who are upper middle class. And I'll tell you why I say that. And it runs against my, some of my values and runs with some of my values. And I say this, I've already sort of warned you that I tend to be on the, uh, towards the left of things. And that is people do feel and they feel rightly that they earn what they're getting through Social Security. If you then say, well, if you earn above a certain amount, we're not going to give you your Social Security check, people feel ripped off. Now, that's different from means testing, but even means testing is terrible language. I mean, it, it's, it's not language that conveys the idea that, look, if, you, if, you, if, you, um, if, you may, if you're bringing in um, a half a million dollars a year while you're retired, does that extra thirty, forty thousand mean that much to you, or could it be helpful, more helpful to somebody who's who's making sixteen or fifteen or twelve? Uh, and um, 
it's the kind of thing that might call for, for creative policy solutions. And again, I'm not a policy person in this. I haven't studied this. But creative policy solutions like tax breaks, uh, excuse me, um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, tax incentives for, um, for um, wealthy people who are entitled to their Social Security, who, excuse me, who deserve their Social Security for having paid in, but who designate it to a charity or designate it to poorer Social Security recipients. That's a very different framing of the same idea that doesn't have that idea that I'm going to take away something from you that you paid into. And it's a, I think that's a dilemma that we do need to face in this area because I think it's, I think it's one that a, a lot of the pushback is this, is this idea, even on something that seems so basic as yeah. means testing, yeah. it's part of the pushback. Drew is supposed to be our keynote, not our big guy. We're not supposed to keep him up here answering questions for 30 minutes, and we are over time. So I'll tell you what, I see a few people that have never asked a question before at this meeting. So could you, questions only, or uh, and then we'll let Drew respond all at once. So, uh, John? Yeah, yeah, thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, talk about the politics and the utilization of fear, okay. which has been used very effectively politics, in recent Politics, utilization decades. of fear. Okay, and behind you? My question uh, is actually pretty similar to that one. Um, I've often been upset by the ruthlessness I see in messaging from the other side, uh, death panels, the death tax. How do you combat ruthlessness without being ruthless yourself, and is, is that possible? I like these words, politics, fear, ruthlessness. <laughs> ruthlessness. Um, mine was on uh, lack of knowledge or awareness, which is something, you know, we're always like, uh, well, people just don't know, Americans just don't know how social insurance programs serve them, um, and stigma. Uh, like Medicaid recipients, millions receive it, yet people aren't aware that millions receive it. So what's going on? Why, if millions receive it, why aren't more people aware that millions receive it? Okay. Please. I guess my question's a little similar to theirs, but uh, the line between positivity and negativity yeah. and how policymakers and majority of Americans, from my view, respond better to positivity, but sometimes the data that we present or the things that we work on are about fixing problems or negative issues. Yeah. Negative issues, okay. And finally? As communicators, do we need to pay attention to the nuances of multi-generational messages? Are there differences that we need to pay attention to, or is it grassroots and all the same? Okay, these are all super questions. I'm going to try to. You'll help me out, right? If yep. I forget to answer Fear, some. Fear, ruthless, uh, okay. stigma, positive, negative, and nuances of multi-generational. Okay, so let me start. Let me, and I'll do this quickly. Um, um, there is, um, there is a, there's a difference between, in general, between the right and the left in willingness to use, um, to use messages that get at, um, uh, at fear. Uh, Fear-based messaging, um, and um, the um, it's usually described as um, in terms of the ruthlessness of the right, which often is true. I mean, the war on terror was a terrible, you know, it was a was an example of that that was uh, um, that was used to you know scare the hell out of people for years. Uh, death panels was you know it was one of these things that I remember hearing my. Hearing my friends on the left say, oh, isn't that stupid? And I said, no, that's not stupid at all, and that's going to catch on like wildfire. Because if you think about what lies behind that idea of death panels, it is that if, in fact, government becomes more involved with health care, there will be blue ribbon panels appointed that will have to make some decisions about how do we distribute a fixed amount of resources and what about the 80-year-old guy who's got a liver problem and where do we prioritize him? That's what, that's what death panels played into. And, of course, there was an obvious answer, which, which is we already have death panels. They're called insurance companies. But that's another whole story. Um, the, um, the, the, um, the point I would make about, and this gets to the positivity-negativity uh, question uh, as well, and that is that um, if you look at all of the great political communicators who have ever accomplished anything, they have never just appealed to hope or just appealed to anxiety or anger. They've always used both. If you think about, um, uh, if you think about, um, uh, about uh, FDR, um, he was, I mean, there is a quintessent, there was a quintessentially hopeful man. I mean, you, you don't get more hopeful than that 
uh, despite the, 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 the years of dealing with, with polio and, and having to stand in front of crowds and walk in front of crowds as if you're walking. I mean, to be able to pull that off and, and to have the kind of disposition that he had, this was a man of hope. But that didn't stop him from going after the titans of industry when they were threatening his, his New Deal. He went right after them. Uh, uh, and, and you all know that famous quote about, about um, I'm, I'm sure, about um, at no time have you know, so, so many powerful men uh, been united uh, in their hatred towards one man, and I welcome their hatred. I mean, that's negativity, right? But you know what? Um, it's also, in a funny way, positivity. It's the same way Ronald Reagan did this in his, uh, his convention address in 1996. Um, he was running against, I mean, 19, 1996, 1984. He was running against Walter Mondale. And he, was, he, was, he went off, you know, with a big smile on his face, and then it goes to, it goes to kind of sour. And he says, and the liberals and the Democrats, they want to do this and this and this. And he goes off on all the spending they want to do. He says, and they're spending like drunken sailors. And he stops. He goes, now, no, wait, wait. That's, that's, that's not fair to the sailors. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody, everybody left. Um, but the, my, my point is that, um, that you want people to, to, to share the value that, uh, and, and this is, uh, 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 on one of the slides that I, I put this up about the structure of an effective communication, political communication, you want them to start out in a place where they connect with you, where they go, yeah, all right, this is this person who's speaking my values. This is a person who's speaking my values and my interest. Um, if you don't tell them what the dangers are, you are failing them. And if you don't do it in a way that's evocative, you're failing them, because then they're not going to worry about them. Uh, um, that doesn't mean that you have to demagogue it, but it does mean that you want people to be anxious about what happens if someone who's trying to destroy Social Security has their way. But you want to end with something hopeful that they come back to and they say, all right, there is a danger, but there's someone who's got my back, and I'm, I'm, I'm with them on this one. And that's where you want to be. The last thing I'll just say about positivity and negativity is – People respond completely un differently, unconsciously and consciously, to positivity and negativity. And I, I, I won't get into the studies that I've actually done on this. We did one for Anderson Cooper 360 of the Hillary Hillary's um, 3 a.m. ad against Barack Obama and of uh, the MoveOn.org ad, uh, McSame as Bush, uh, where what we found was that people said they hated both ads and they both activated exactly the associations they were aimed at activating. And Hillary's, in fact, was actually they, – their, their conscious attitudes um, correlated with their exit poll results, which said they thought that, what she, that she'd run an unfair campaign in Ohio where she ran that ad. Their unconscious attitudes predicted their voting behavior in, in, in Ohio, which is that they voted for her over Barack Obama. Uh, so the, the, um, the, the last – just comment I'll make on that is uh, you don't need to even know all of that, the, the, how, how we did that, what the science was behind it, other than to look at, uh, at um, the Republican primaries this time and look at the effect of positive versus negative ads. If Newt Gingrich, when Newt Gingrich decided n not to respond to the attacks in Iowa, I was flabbergasted that such an experienced politician could be so stupid. Uh, because if you let people attack you, and this is true, by the way, of Social Security and Medicare, if you let people f attack you, you are essentially ceding those associations to the other side so that all that's in the brains of, of everyone out there are the associations the other side is building. So you can't afford to do that. Uh, on the other hand, of course, you don't want to be a messenger of, a messenger of doom who becomes associated with, with, with the negativity, and that's probably what Gingrich was trying to avoid because his pollsters probably told him, you know, people don't like you very much. Uh, so you probably shouldn't be too negative, and that's, that's why he did that. But boy, did he turn things around by going on the attack, and it won for him. And it seems like it's going the other way with Romney. Thank you so much. We're going to quickly bring up the next and last panel. And, 
have, and you break while you're while we're switching up here. We'll get started at 2:30. Thanks.